Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. And today we're talking once again with Dr. Carter Beck. Dr. Beck is a neurosurgeon who practices in Missoula, Montana at Neurological Associates. Dr. Beck did his medical school training at the University of Chicago, and from there a neurosurgery residency at Stanford University. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Beck. It's a pleasure to be here, Randall. Thanks for having me back. Dr. Beck, the last time we were together, we talked a bit about sacroiliac joint pain, a condition that causes low back and hip pain in adults primarily. And at that time, we talked a bit about the disease process, and you were just starting with some experimentation about a new technique that you hoped would help solve this problem for patients uh, suffering from sacroiliac joint pain. Can you review for us your history since that time and a little bit of review about sacroiliac joint pain and then talk a little bit about how you're proceeding at this point to uh, treat this disease process? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to. The uh, story with the SI joint is an interesting one. I, I think it's one of the last joints that uh, modern medicine has not really uh, fully gotten a handle on. and. And one of the interesting things about the SI joint is it's a joint that doesn't normally move. It, it, it's a joint that is there sort of for developmental reasons because of the way the bones form. And it's a joint that in one moment in life is functional and that's when a woman gives birth. And, and at that point the, the ligaments loosen up and the, and the SI joint allows the pelvic outlet to open and the baby to be born. And the rest of the time in life, that's a joint that doesn't move. And maybe that's why we haven't been able to figure out this, this joint and why it has been such a vexing problem in medicine. Uh, there were attempts for many years to uh, treat the, the SI joint surgically, and those attempts were pretty uniformly viewed as failures. And so oh, for the last probably 30, 40 years, there's been very, very few and far between reports of people actually operating on the SI joint, whereas re we really operate on every other joint in the body. The um, the old procedures were, were generally lateral procedures, procedures that were sort of destructive. They were procedures that were done um, um, it, using the technology of the day, which I think was a little bit cruder than what we do today. Um, the interest in, in dealing with uh, low back and lumbosacral pain sort of moved away from the SI joint as a result of the failed experiences with with those old procedures, and people were focused more on the lumbar spine. And many of us uh, do a lot of lumbar spinal surgery. And um, as a result, we've, we've gotten uh, patients who, who we can fix their lumbar spine, but we know that there's a problem in the SI joint. And, and when I was going through training, and I think when you were being trained as an orthopedist as well, we were taught you can't fix it. Don't try to operate on it. Send the patient to the pain clinic. There's nothing you can do. In fact, some people said patients with SI joint problems are crazy. And, you know, and that is something I think that a, a physician should always be very careful about saying when, when it's a problem that we're not sure we understand. Uh, maybe they're not crazy, maybe we're just not solving their problem. And, and, and that's the way I always felt about it. As I went along in, in the practice of, of spinal surgery, I recognized that there were patients who I thought I was going to get better and they weren't getting better and it was because there was still a pain generator left and it was the SI joint. And it really bothered me that, that I wasn't making an attempt to, to fix these patients who desperately needed help. And I started exploring what, what they had done in the past and what maybe they had overlooked and maybe what we could do differently in the future. And the idea of operating on the, on the SI joint from a straight posterior approach occurred to me. And that's what over the last four or five years since uh, we last spoke about the SI joint I've been working on and really with great success. And we're, we're to the point now uh, with partners in industry that we are going to, uh, I think, uh, really make a difference and change the way the SI joint is, is thought about uh, worldwide. I think I'll have to agree with you that we've all had the experience of trying to diagnose a problem with low back pain and sort of getting the notion that uh, this may be coming from a place outside the spine and, and the question of the SI joint comes up. And I think I also agree with you that, uh, you know, during my 30 years of practice, uh, I've had folks who uh, uh, I've been associated with that would, that would even deny that the SI joint could be a source of pain. Uh, and a lot of the folks that I trained with would deny that the SI joint uh, 
could be a source of pain. But I think we've all had the experience as we started using injections and placing Novocaine or lidocaine into different joints, uh, something that we think is probably the best diagnostic test that we have in terms of being able to uh, anesthetize or numb up a joint, assuming that that pain is uh, going to go away once that joint is numbed up and, and completely um, anesthetized, that when we do this in the SI joint, uh, in a lot of cases where we're trying to isolate the pain, that procedure makes the pain go completely away and it's repeatable. It can be done again and again and that pain uh, will go away temporarily at least. Well, yeah, it, you touch on two important things. One is, is that it's difficult to diagnose SI joint pain and how do we do that? And that's maybe one of the reasons why this SI joint has been so late uh, t for us to figure out is, is when people have SI joint pain very frequently, there aren't radiographic, there aren't things you can see on an x-ray, there aren't, aren't findings on a CT scan. So one of the main ways we diagnose it is to do these injections. In fact, the first patient whose SI joint I, I ever operated on was a patient who had had 17 injections in her SI joint. She was a nurse, she had been, was disabled with chronic pain, and she had 17 injections in, in her joint. Each one helped her, but very briefly. And she said to me, doctor, you have to do something. And that's when I began exploring the, the sacroiliac joint and, and really the posterior approach to the SI joint which is, I think, what is different about what I'm doing and what some of the other people who've become interested recently in the problem are, are looking at. The, the posterior approach is, the, I think, the safest, the simplest, and the, and the easiest uh, way, surgery to recover from. You know, I think one should not uh, underestimate the uh, magnitude of the procedure that we used to have to do to fuse the SI joint. You know, the typical sort of fusion operation always had assumed that you need to see the whole joint, remove all the articular cartilage, and then pack that area with bone graft and, and usually put a plate or screws or something to hold that joint in position until it fused. I think the, the, the minimally invasive techniques that have evolved over the last two decades have really changed our thinking in terms of what one has to do to accomplish a fusion. And I think these minimally invasive uh, uh, procedures have allowed us to uh, get the joint fused without damaging or destroying a lot of normal tissue. Now I'm hoping that you're going to talk a little bit about one of these new minimally invasive uh, procedures that you've developed for the SI joint in particular. So uh, can you describe a little bit about how this has affected your approach to the SI joint? Yeah, that's absolutely right, and I think that that was part of the problem with the old procedures, that even if you were able to get the joint to fuse, you, you did so much damage to the surrounding structures, the gluteal muscles, the, potentially the S1 nerve root, the, the gluteal artery, the ligaments that hold the floor of the pelvis together. Um, the, the, the damage was, was a treatment worse than the disease, and yeah, the, maybe the SI joint pain's gone, but now they have chronic post-surgical pain. And so the, the real trick, I think, with any operation, but particularly the SI joint, uh, is to get in there and get it done with the minimal amount of, of tissue damage that you can, and, and to do it safely as well. And, um, and when you're dealing with, with elective surgery for chronic pain, it, it, the margin of safety has to be very, very high. And I think that that's what we've done with these new posterior approaches to the SI joint. I think one of the, um, one of the misconceptions in the past about the SI joint was is that it was difficult to fixate and you had to do these, these radical um, um, bony operations in order to immobilize the joint and get it to fuse successfully. I think in reality, it, the, the joint is actually very easy to fixate. It doesn't really move very much when, when it's causing pain. It's a minimal amount of movement. And that the, the thing is, is if you have the right mechanical advantage in your construct, which is I think what the posterior approach offers, you're gonna get the joint to fuse. And that's in fact what I've seen over the last four or five years doing these, these procedures. Well, let's talk a little bit about your indications for surgery. Um, when do you sit down with the patients and have the discussion that perhaps all of the conservative measures have failed and it's time to consider some type of surgical intervention uh, for the SI joint pain? 
The, um, first of all, the, the difficulty is, of course, identifying that it's the sacroiliac joint, and there are a few characteristics th things. One, they're usually tender over, they point to the SI joint posteriorly as the source of their pain, and they're usually tender when you examine uh, a patient with SI joint dysfunction. Um, two, they, um, they usually have pain that is much worse when sitting. Um, I think that that might be a little bit different between men and women, uh, but um, in general the, the complaint is it's worse when I sit and it's better when I stand. Men are, are, are tend to a little bit more often complain of it when they stand as well. The male and female pelvis are, are of course very different. And then the injections. If they respond very convincingly to an injection, I think that you have um, as good of a diagnosis as, as you can. Obviously, axial imaging like CT or MRI scan may show something, but for the most part, the axial imaging is unremarkable. So it's a very much a clinical diagnosis. It has to sound like sacroiliac disease. It has to respond to the injection. Once you're convinced that a patient has pain coming from the SI joint, unfortunately, there isn't really Really much in the way of conservative therapy that, that anybody has ever shown to be terribly effective. There is physical therapy. There are a series of, of exercises and stretches that the physical therapists recommend. I think in, in some cases that that's effective. Most of the patients that I see who've been referred to a surgeon have, have tried a, a course of physical therapy with, with a physical therapist who understands how to treat the SI joint. Um, sometimes uh, anti-inflammatories like uh, Advil or, or, or an over-the-counter um, one like um, excuse me, a prescription one like um, meloxicam can make a difference. Um, postural correction, changing your seat, all of these things are tried. Um, and then often narcotics, and I think that it's a big mistake for any, really any chronic musculoskeletal pain to start down the road of, of taking narcotics. And I, I personally advocate early surgery rather than having somebody be on, on narcotics for a long period of time. Unfortunately, when you talk about non-operative management, a lot of the time that's what ends up getting prescribed, and I think sometimes we underestimate the dangers of that. And when you have this discussion with patients, how do you describe the risk versus the benefits of this procedure? How do you have that discussion with the patient? Well, I, I tell them a story very similar to what we've just discussed about how the, our thinking about the SI joint has changed o over the years and, um, and then talk about how, how much risk a patient is willing to take to get relief of their symptoms. Fortunately, it appears that the procedure that I'm doing has very low risk. I've had no complications, really none, with it. I had one patient I had to operate on twice because the implant was, was not quite in the right position. But otherwise, out of about 60 cases, I've had no significant complications. Any surgery, of course, carries risk, and the patient needs to understand that. And so you're balancing the risk of, of operating with the risk of not operating, which, as we were just discussing, is sometimes is, is significant. The psychological uh, or psychiatric implications of chronic pain are, are significant. The psychiatric uh, implications of taking narcotics regularly are significant. When you have a procedure that takes a half an hour in the operating room and, and has minimal morbidity and, um, and is easy to recover from, um, it, it, I think the patients can, uh, can be the judge. What, what sounds worse? So let's talk a little bit about the procedure itself. Can you describe this procedure for patients and how it's evolved in your thinking? Okay, so, so here's a model of the pelvis. I'll just rotate it 360 for the camera. This is the pelvis. This is the front. This is the back. This is the spinal column right here. These are, are the uh, iliac crests, which are attached to the hip. This in the back here is the tailbone, or the sacrum. And the joint between the ilium and the sacrum is the sacroiliac joint. And um, very often where patients complain they're having pain is right here in, the, in this cleft. And if you, and if you look at, at, at the real anatomy of this, the joint has a, an anterior sort of true joint, and then there's a gap back here. Um, and that gap is sometimes large, and the gap is usually larger in women than in men, which is probably how the pelvis hinges open at, at childbirth. 
the um, when we when I first started looking at at getting to the sacroiliac joint and looked at the old operations, which were a direct lateral approach where you had to tunnel under six inches of gluteal muscle to get to the joint, it it seemed to me to be just overly destructive, and and so I thought, how can I get to it from here? When we talked last time, we I, I had started um, attempting to access the joint through this posterior ligamentous cleft. And, uh, and I found success with that. I also found it a little bit cumbersome in the operating room. The, the uh, anatomy of the joint is, is pretty um, difficult to determine went through a little incision uh, posteriorly. And, and the thought occurred, well, why don't we access the joint by going straight through this bone right here? And as you know, this bone is called the, the, the posterior superior iliac crest or iliac spine. And, um, and so if we go to the PSIS, we, you realize that the skin's right here and it's, and it's a centimeter of fatty tissue, nothing important, and then you're on bone. And then it's a straight shot down into the joint. And so the, the realization was is that we can access the SI joint, which is deep inside, inside the human body by, without going through really anything um, vital and it's possible to drill a hole straight in through the posterior superior iliac spine and uh, into the, this portion of the, um, of the sacrum, which is called the sacral ala. And it turns out the sacral ala, the, the target there where we'd like our implant to end up, the implant that we're going to use to fuse the joint, is, is quite large. And, uh, and so that makes it a very safe uh, procedure. We developed an implant that looks like this that we, we can fill with a biological material to um, stimulate fusion and, uh, and simply drill it in. And in practice, it takes about 20 minutes to, uh, to do a procedure. So this is the device we've developed. It's a titanium cylinder, basically. It has uh, threads because it gets screwed in, and it has an open channel in the middle with holes on the side. And what that allows us to do, Randall, is to, is to put in a, a, a material to promote grafting. There are a number of, of materials that a surgeon can choose to put in, including the patient's own bone that comes after we've drilled the hole. We fill the cage up, we call it a cage, even though it's really a cylinder, fill it up with some material to promote fusion and then, and then drill it in. And it, it goes in very, very easily and, um, and really we, we haven't had to, to disrupt any muscle tissue, we haven't had to move any nerves, we haven't really had to do anything particularly dangerous. Um, the depth that, that, that you put in, you put, that, uh, to which you put it in, of course, matters. Um, in general, about 50 uh, millimeters or five centimeters um, is about the right uh, the depth for almost everybody. Um, and, and so I'm really happy this, uh, this is an implant that was de developed with industry and, um, and I think it's gonna be a winner. So let's talk a little bit more about the details of, of what goes on around the procedure. Is, is this an outpatient procedure or should I expect to stay overnight uh, in the hospital? You know, it probably could be an outpatient procedure. I've been uh, keeping my patients in the hospital one night. Uh, almost, I think everybody has gone home the next morning after this procedure with really not a lot of post-operative pain, a little bit of incisional pain, of course, but really not a lot of pain. And, and many patients uh, appreciate that the pain that they were suffering from when they went to sleep is now gone. Um, and that the instruction is to get, keep a Band-Aid on the incision and um, call me in the morning. We really don't um, have to keep you down. We don't, you're not laid up. You, you can go about your business. Obviously, I don't, I don't want you going mountain climbing or, or skydiving. I'd like you to take it easy for a month after surgery, but um, no crutches, uh, no walker, nothing, nothing um, other than just taking it easy in everyday life. And you were mentioning that this is done under a general anesthesia. This isn't done under a local block or, or some type of regional block? Yeah, it's a general anesthetic. In fact, almost everything I do these days we do with a general anesthetic. It's a better experience for the patients and the anesthetics. The modern anesthetics are so well tolerated that even for a carpal tunnel, my, most of my patients choose to go to sleep. And as a patient, how long does it take to recover from this type of surgery? When do you release the patient to do whatever they want to do uh, on an unlimited basis? 
My practice has been to see patients back at six weeks, and um, at six weeks, if they're doing well, that, that will usually be their last visit. Um, I instruct them that the bones are healing and will continue to heal, and that that is probably a six-month process. So very, very strenuous, high-impact things. So probably three to six months would be optimum. Um, but most people are, are back to normal life easily within six weeks. And we probably ought to mention a little bit about complications or potential complications. I think you've already mentioned that there's not many vital structures uh, between you and the SI joint using this posterior approach. What do you as a surgeon worry about both during the procedure and perhaps after the procedure is over and is healing um, in terms of complications? Well, of course, I worry about infection with any surgery. I've not seen any infections with the, with this operation so far. Uh, so far, I worry about a hematoma, um, general surgical complications. Um, I think the thing, honestly, that I worry about the most is that I picked the right patient and um, that the patient that I've taken to surgery for this actually has sacroiliac joint-mediated pain. And I, I think of if there's one thing that's important is, is, that, is that this kind of procedure be used sparingly for, for patients who have a severe problem and, and patients who we, we're pretty certain that it's the sacroiliac joint. Um, there's a lot of interest in the SI joint these days, and I think that a fair number of cases are getting done that, that probably uh, don't have SI joint mediated pain. In fact, I've, I've seen some come to my office operated by other surgeons that I don't think they ever had SI joint pain, but they've had the procedure. Certainly, it's important that we've ruled out that uh, more obvious spinal causes, identifiable spinal causes for the pain. Um, but that, I guess that's what I worry about the most. Um, everything else has been has been very safe, and um, and you know, by and large, I think uh, I've been good at, at keeping it to, to the patients who really, really need the operation. And given the 60 patients that you've done this operation in, can you sort of give us a, an idea of what your thoughts about the success rate for this operation? Is this something that you feel like is uh, is going to be a, a successful operation in most of the cases? You know, with all of the procedures I do on the spine, procedures that I do for, uh, for pain, uh, I shoot to have a 90% success rate. Any operation that I don't think I have a 90% success rate on, I try not to do unless the, the circumstance is very extreme. And I think that this procedure is, is well within the 90% range. And, and of course, that is the, the art of it is the patient selection and making sure you're doing the right thing for the right reason. Uh, I always tell people with spinal surgery, it's not so much the surgery as doing the right operation for the right reason at the right time on the right patient. And um, if you do that right with, with lumbar spinal surgery, you get 90% results. If you do that right with cervical spinal surgery, you get 90% results. If you do that with this, you get 90% results. Well, I think this has been a fascinating discussion about a new technique, and I, I look forward to talking with you again after maybe the next 60 patients and see how this uh, procedure is going for you at that point. Well, thanks very much for having me. We are going to be studying it. In fact, I, I just got word from our foundation that they funded a grant to do a prospective trial on, on these new, this new posterior fusion of the sacroiliac joint. Well, that's great news, and we'll check back in once you've completed that uh, study and talk about this some more. Thank you.